It is my real pleasure tonight to welcome and introduce Bill Falloon. So what we're going to talk about tonight is the FDA. This is their headquarters in Rockville, Maryland, and they have a mission statement. They claim they're responsible for advancing the public health by helping to speed innovations that make medical products more effective, uh, less uh, dangerous, and more affordable. That's what the FDA says. Well, we have a little bit of a different opinion about that. We believe the FDA policies have resulted in many needless deaths. So on the left is what the FDA says, on the right is what the FDA really does. And that's unfortunately, they are impairing the public health by delaying innovations that make medical products, unfortunately, less safe, less effective. And of course, they cause those products to become very expensive. FDA approval of a drug means the price goes through the roof uh, upwards. So FDA approval does not make drugs more affordable and it does not make them more safe. And unfortunately, they're delaying innovation. And it's not just Bill Balloon saying this or other enlightened individuals. Former commissioner of the FDA wrote an editorial in the Wall Street Journal. We put his picture on the cover of a magazine just to let the world know the FDA is failing. They're unable to ascertain new technologies. And as a result, they're not allowing clinical trials to occur. That is human studies to ascertain if these products really work. And they're delaying the ability of scientists to bring avant-garde therapies to the forefront so people can gain access to them. So that was a former FDA commissioner. This was an acting FDA commissioner testifying before Congress, saying the FDA is relying on 20th century regulatory science to try to ascertain what's happening with the breakthroughs in the 21st century. And this spells disaster for us. We're trying to take advantage of any scientific advance that could prolong our life, and the FDA is standing in the way, and they're admitting it. And Cato Institute came out with a nice position paper in August 2022, talking about the fact we need to speed drug approval because too many people are dying when there are effective therapies available right now that could save their life. And I started putting this presentation together, by the way, back in November when Jonathan Ward asked me to host an event for what he's trying to do to accelerate approval. And here we get the pocket of mechanics, first week of January, talked about that humans can start living longer. We may be able to cure death if the FDA allows us to do more clinical trials. This is the obstacle. The science is there, the funding is there to do the clinical trials, and we've got the FDA saying, no, you can't do that because we don't know how that technology works. Front page of the Wall Street Journal, just five days after that popular mechanics, they talked about a record-breaking number of clinical holds that the FDA is putting on human studies. They're coming in and saying, you have to stop the study. Now, in some cases, that's because there's some safety issues. But in most of the cases, the FDA admits the technology is so new, they don't understand it. So therefore, stop your clinical trial. And what does that mean? Well, potential cure for pancreatic cancer, glioblastoma, dementia, heart failure, it doesn't move into the clinical setting. And this is the FDA admitting it. They're halting clinical trials because they don't understand the new technology we need to achieve super longevity. For those who don't know what I've done in the past, I've collectively uh, written books that have sold many millions of copies. On, on the left there, Disease Prevention and Treatment, that's 1,500 pages of medical text on what can be done in addition to conventional medicine to better prevent and treat disease. On the right, FDA failure, decep deception, and abuse. Well, this is a chronology of what the FDA has done in the past and continues to do delay access to therapies that have demonstrated efficacy. And we update this book about every three or four years. It's about 1,500 pages, but don't buy the book. And I say that because innovation is occurring so quickly, we now post all of these on the internet. So you don't have to buy a big book and look through it. You can just go right to your computer and look. If you have a chronic illness that's not being effectively treated, we may have a solution, and you don't have to read it in, in a book. And I've also written books on the corrupt deals that go on between Big Pharma and the FDA. I'm going to show you some of that later in this presentation. It's frightening what the FDA will approve if Big Pharma is behind it and what they will disapprove or not allow when it's not a Big Pharma company. We publish a magazine every month. We bring out ways to potentially delay aging, potentially reduce your risk of a degenerative illness. And we've been ahead of the curve on almost everything we recommend. What you see in our magazine, you'll often see on a health food store shelf a couple of years later. We try to keep our supporters alive and healthy. So our controversial contention, 
is it may be possible to reverse aging in humans today. Might be possible. A lot of evidence is pointing to that. And this all started about nine years ago. In Time Magazine, they talked about children born around that time are going to live a lot longer. And that was interesting news. That was based on some primitive scientific advances that are now far more advanced in their stage. And then other media sources started to pick up on the science. The fact that we're going to be able to extend lifespans in ways that people never thought possible. And I garnered a lot of media coverage. Popular Science did a big story about me and the research we were funding. They were calling me the forever man because our objective is to extend human life as far as science will allow us. There's no upper limit threshold. George Church at Harvard, working with CRISPR technology, he feels he'll be able to reverse aging in people by year 2030 gives us a lot of incentive to take care of ourselves today to be able to take advantage of his CRISPR research to reverse biological aging to make older people grow young again. Cover of new scientists talking about a cure for aging. And before 2015, you never saw this because it was thought to be impossible. And it was impossible before 2015. The science keeps moving forward and investors, entrepreneurs are getting into this, putting in big money, their objective. They want to find a way to enable people to live a lot longer, a lot healthier, and not face the risk of, well, premature death. Uh, MIT did a nice story about the work I'm doing, talking about old age is over. And it didn't, they didn't really say that per se in the article, but the fact that we are promoting longevity through scientific advancements that were unheard of in the past, it's garnering us front cover media headlines. And people often ask, were you doing this in the animal model? Is it working in people? Well, 2019, a published paper came out in Aging Cells, showed that some of the research we helped to fund, in which they took just three uh, ingredients, basically, one year of human growth hormone, metformin and DHEA, and they were able to reverse aging two and a half biological years. They were also able to regenerate the thymus gland so that the immune system was functioning more capably. And that study has been expanded to a much larger group of people. We're going to hear the results of that over the next couple months. This study made international headline news. Uh, GDF11 is a protein that may have systemic age reversal benefits. Uh, New York Times gave it a nice write-up just in July 2022. And new scientists talking about how to grow younger. And I'm showing you all this to let you know that this is accumulating, but we don't you often pay attention to it. The, the news focuses on the war, the plague, the politics, and we don't realize we're in the midst of a biomedical renaissance where people are gonna start living a lot longer, a lot healthier than what people could ever imagine. And MIT reported the Saudis are gonna spend a billion dollars a year, and it has to be every year. You just can't spend a billion dollars to expect a miracle to occur to fund research to enable people to live a lot longer and a lot healthier. So a heck of a lot is going on. And, and just since uh, my recent talk that I gave in December, uh, Medscape, this is a conservative website that medical doctors use to access new information. It even offers continuing medical education credits to doctors. They're talking about the advances that are going to enable people to understand biological aging and enable clinicians to start doing something about it. National Geographic, right at the end of 2022, did an extensive article on all the different research that I've been involved in and others for the last eight, nine years. And they're talking about a cure for aging. Hard to imagine, I know, but this is what the media is covering and it's based on scientific studies. January 1st, Wired Magazine, read by people in Silicon Valley, uh, computer tech people, they're talking about a drug potentially being available by the end of this year to reverse aging in people. That's how fast this technology is accelerating and media sources are paying attention to it. Very next day in the Financial Times, this is one of the bigger financial newspapers in the world, uh, all the different companies that are starting right now to put money into scientists' hands so they can bring these therapies that are working in the laboratory into the clinical setting so that old people can benefit from these age reversal interventions. So if you go back to March 2022, something happened. For the first time in history, aging was reversed in live mice. Now you've heard aging being reversed in cell cultures. You've seen tissue uh, regeneration occur, which is a little bit indicative of age reversal. But systemic age reversal had not been done yet. And this garnered a fair amount of publicity, but again, a lot of competition for your, your, the news media. They don't pay attention to everything as much as they should. But the Salk Institute, they used a Yamanaka 
therapy, this is a transcription factor I'm going to describe to you next, to reverse aging in live mice for the first time in history. It had never been done before, and it even caught the eyes of Jimmy Fountain of The Tonight Show. I'll play, play you a quick video. Uh, and finally, this is amazing. There's a new therapy that could actually reverse the aging process by making your cells young again. Yeah, it's crazy. Soon people might be able to go back to how they looked years ago. So we're getting recognition. Salk Institute, very prestigious group, by the way. They were able to take middle-aged and elderly mice and put their aging process in reverse. They restored them to a more youthful state. And what they did is they reprogrammed their cells so that they would go backwards in time, literally. And they used these Yamanaka transcription factors, and they figured, found that the longer administration demonstrated unique benefits, and most important, no toxicity or increase in cancer detected. And they were so concerned about that, but in this study, that did not happen. And as it relates to transcription factors, these are proteins that help turn on and off our genes. And there are certain pro-youth genes that dissipate with age. We want those turned back on. And there are also some toxic genes that start to express themselves. We want those suppressed. So transcription factors are able to take very old cells and reverse them as far back as the embryonic stage. Now, we don't need that to happen to us. We just want to have our cells reversed back to maybe when we were 21, 25 years of age. I think everyone in this room might appreciate that. Uh, and if they're, if, they, if they're young and they don't understand what aging is all about, they, they will learn about that. Now, you know, Yamanaka factors won the Nobel Prize, Dr. Yamanaka, in 2012 for finding four specific transcription factors that convert old cells back into induced pluripotent stem cells that can propagate indefinitely. We've got the potential here of biological immortality right before our eyes. So move forward, January 2023, another study uh, in which live mice had their aging process go in reverse. And this garnered lots and lots of media coverage because when Harvard does something, well, the media pays attention. So CNN proclaimed, if old mice are growing young again, can people do the same? And the reality is the way they did the research, it doesn't apply to people, but it did prove a concept. You can take an old mouse and enable it to regenerate itself and grow younger. So lots and lots of favorable publicity on this particular study. So going back to the salt study, we, they learned that the skin cells divide more rapidly in response to these Yamanaka factors. By the way, this is nothing you can buy yet. It's something that researchers are using to reverse the aging in cells. But the, they, 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 the younger looking skin, less inflammation, less senescent cell burdens, but there was no data collected on lifespan. They were able to show age reversal, but they didn't demonstrate that these mice lived longer. We don't think they even tried to demonstrate that, which is a problem when you have reduced funding. Well, that all changed. January 2023, MIT reports on a relatively small group of people who are using Yamanaka factors, and they were able to rejuvenate old mice back to youth and extend their remaining lifespan. They used a partial reprogramming. They used three out of the four Yamanaka factors to mice that were the human equivalent of 77 years, and they more than doubled their remaining lifespan. They were able to reduce frailty and, and induce a number of anti-aging benefits that were measurable. So what they did is took these mice, remember live mice, not test tubes anymore, and they, they induced the Yamanaka factors using a drug called doxycycline. Now doxycycline, don't take that to induce Yamanaka factors in your body because they're not there yet. You don't have the Yamanaka factors uh, programmed in your cells. But they used that as a trigger to turn on the Yamanaka factors and turn them off. And that the human equivalent was more than doubling. So a 70 year old today, we're supposed to live another 15 years. If we're a healthy 70, we're supposed to live to about 85. But if you more than double our remaining lifespan, that gets us an extra 31 years. That gets us up to about age 100. And if we live to age 100, think of the technology is gonna be around at that point in time to induce age reversal and longevity. And how they did this is they took a, a, an innocuous virus, an adeno-associated virus, and they encoded it with three of the four you know, Yamanaka factors. They injected them with a the virus. And then whenever they wanted to induce the Yamanaka factor age reversal effect, they just gave them doxycycline in their drinking water. And you look at the bottom of the slide, the results, reversal of epigenetic aging markers, restoration of youthful functionality, and most exciting, to me anyway, the extension of remaining lifespan by 109%. Wow. 
This means older people can benefit, not just younger people, who some people have feared that maybe we'll find a way to control aging in people 50, but if they reach 90, we can't do anything about it. We think that's, that all been changed. So this is being transitioned into humans with researchers that we're interacting with. But we first have to try it on some dogs, monkeys, old dogs and old monkeys, and maybe save their life. Maybe take a, a pet that's very precious to you and have its aging process go in reverse so you get to enjoy a lot more time with your pet than you ever thought you could do so. So let me give you a brief chronology of what's happened because the world doesn't quite understand this. For the first time ever in 2006, they were able to reprogram an old cell back into a young cell. They didn't think that could ever be done. And in 2011, they took a 100-year-old human cell and put that back into an embryonic stage. 2022, 100% of the human genome sequenced. So in the Salk Institute, reversed aging in live mice using the Yamanaka factors. And then 2022, research underway to attempt to do this in some old humans. But here we are, 2023, uh, less than two months into it, and two other laboratories have used these Yamanaka factors to reverse aging in live mice. This is absolutely incredible. And as it relates to humans, umbilical cord plasma concentrates injected once a week for 10 weeks induced age reversal. They, these are 74-year-old people on average. They were getting a weekly injection of an umbilical cord concentrate. Each one of these concentrates equaled four umbilical cord infusions. And what they found is, well, uh, a 0.78 year younger measure called grim age. It's a DNA methylation test. It's the most accurate way of measuring biological aging. So after only 10 weeks, they saw some indicators of age reversal, but for a lot of us with kidney issues, they saw some improvement in kidney function and 30% of the biomarkers improved. They were able to see that improve beneficially, uh, no side effects. So this therapy was shown to reverse aging partially in people. Uh, the one that was done with the growth hormone metformin DHEA uh, over a period of a year, reversed aging two and a half years. So we're seeing people's aging process go into reverse. This is a study that probably ignited more of a firestorm of interest than any that's ever been published, January 2020. They took the C. elegans model of aging and they manipulated just two signaling pathways within the cell and they were able to increase the lifespan to the equivalent of four to 500 human years. This caught the attention of a lot of billionaires, some of them very famous, thinking, you mean I could potentially live for hundreds of years instead of just 89 or 99? So a lot of money went into research after this study was published, but it at least proves the concept that you can take an organism that's supposed to die at a certain time, and like people, we're supposed to die around the age of 80 if we stay healthy, and we might be able to live several hundred years using a technology that's not that far off. Now, WebMD, another conservative website, they talked about, is there a cure for aging out there? They talked about research that I'm doing and others, where we're not just trying to reverse aging, the ultimate goal, prevent death, trying to stay alive indefinitely. I know it's controversial, but here's WebMD putting this chart together, indicating if we just make it to about year 2065, we might live a long, long time. And that has caused a lot of people to say, well, if you could do that, you spare Medicare from insolvency, you spare the social security system, it's pretty much spare what everyone's afraid of, and that is too many old people and not enough young ones to support them. So they asked this question, Fortune, why not launch Operation Warp Speed? to defeat biological aging. And unfortunately, there's an impediment. We've got all the science that I just described, but before we can get it, the FDA has to approve the clinical trials to validate it. We've got the money to do the trials, we've got the scientists, and we have the science. And yet, we're not able to move forward at the pace we need to because of FDA over-regulation. It's gotten to be a, a problem, and I like to use analogies when I can. It took 400 years after a cure for scurvy was discovered before everyone accepted it. 400 years. Thousands of deaths, probably millions of needless deaths really occurred. We just don't have epidemiological data back then. And you look at something a little more recent, uh, antibody, antibiotic properties of penicillin, uh, published in 1929, but not widely available until 1946. Lots of de needless deaths. So you had that 16 year delay between penicillin being discovered and it becoming widely available and human age reversal. Well, around 2015, people thought that's viable. That scientifically may occur and we're still waiting. 
And we don't have that kind of time to wait because we're losing over 6,000 Americans over the age of 64 every single day to an age-related degenerative condition. We've got to do something to reverse aging fast, or we're going to keep losing people we care for and losing ourselves. This is an example of something that was effective in this little study against pancreatic cancer. As most of you know, there is no real significant cure for that disease. But they did something with an existing cancer drug. They gave them interleukin-2 prior to surgery. And you look at the blue uh, column there, the interleukin-2 group, and after two years, 33%. They were alive. Control group, only 10%. And then the three-year survival, you had 22% in the interleukin-2 group, none in the group not given it, and fewer post-operative complications. Now, that was published in 2006. I cannot find another human trial that attempted to replicate these results. And the big reason is the challenge of getting FDA approval. There's so much paperwork involved, so much expense, and this is an off-patent drug. No one may ever do another study. If we don't break down the bureaucratic barriers that are slowing access to effective therapies. You have advanced prostate cancer. This study showed you double your lifespan with just supplemental melatonin. And this study needs to be repeated. But again, the high cost of conducting clinical research, it delays research uh, from starting, it precludes research sometimes from ever beginning. So here's an example of how overbearing the FDA has become. Uh, fisetin is a, uh, it happens to be an ingredient in strawberries and a lot of healthy plants, but it's also sold by dozens of companies as a dietary supplement. Many people take this, hundreds of thousands maybe, we know it's safe, but the people at Mayo Clinic, Mayo Clinic, they want to do a study to see if fisetin really worked to extend lifespan by removing senescent cells. Senescent cells accumulate as we age. They emit chronic inflammatory signals. They degrade healthy tissues. We need to get rid of excess senescent cells. So Dr. Kirkland, genius researcher at Mayo Clinic, one of these prestigious places, goes to the FDA and says, I want to do a study on this dietary supplement that people are already taking. FDA requires a 450-page detailed investigational new drug application. They wanted animal studies to be done on fisetin to ensure it's safe. And yet people have been taking it now for years as a supplement. We all know it's safe. And they wanted pharmacology studies. So he had spent two and a half years, and he's not happy about that two and a half year delay in order to get FDA approval to test a dietary supplement that people are already taking. He just wants to try to validate how well is it working to slow or reverse aging. And we're running into this problem right now with so many areas of research we want to fund. You walk into CVS or Walgreens, you see a wall of vitamins, and you think, wow, that's fantastic. All those great choices, and it is fantastic. But guess what? In 1974, Big Pharma wanted to convert dietary supplements into prescription drugs. Big Pharma and Congress were working together to change the law. So you'd need a prescription to get your vitamins. And there's only one reason why that failed. One reason. And that was Senator William Proxmire. He fought the entire Congress and Big Pharma and got the public behind him, by the way, in a major way. They were inundating Congress with letters demanding that they don't pass a law causing supplements to convert to prescription drugs. This one senator spared our access to dietary supplements in the 1970s period. In fact, there was so much mail written to Congress, it was the second hottest topic other than the Vietnam War. That's how much one senator's impact can have as far as saving access to something we feel is very important. But that didn't stop the FDA. You look at this GSC store, really very nicely lit up, looks very inviting. You wouldn't think that their executives got indicted in 1980, uh, criminal investigation launched. They were facing five years in jail, and their crime was promoting a primrose oil dietary supplement, and their promotion consisted of them selling a book and GNC, and also selling primrose oil. FDA said that's a crime. That book converted the primrose oil into an unapproved new drug, according to the FDA. And they fought this. GNC didn't just back down. They fought it for a couple of years. They didn't have an attorney like Jonathan Moore that was supporting them. You're going to hear Jonathan talk after me. And they pled guilty. You've got honest people who pled guilty to something that wasn't even a crime just to avoid five years in jail. And then GNC stopped promoting primrose oil. Well, if you wonder what primrose oil does, this is a chart of the studies from 1948 to 2022. And you can see there's been a tremendous amount of research to substantiate that this 
dietary supplement has benefits. And these just I mean, these are some of the benefits. This is kind of a, uh, a summary of the, of the benefits of all the different disorders that primrose oil might be effective in treating. And yet the FDA didn't want people to know about that. So we looked through the published literature since the FDA was claiming this is a dangerous unapproved drug. We wanted to see, well, what is there out there to validate it? And we were surprised. We found about 36 studies really quickly. I'm running through them really quick now. But you can look at all of these uh, when you look at my PowerPoint presentation if you want to later on. But all this data substantiating primrose oil, and the FDA said it was worthless. Said there's no benefit to it whatsoever. If you happen to have renal dysfunction, uh, rheumatoid conditions, any kind of inflammatory disorder, you might want to try something like this out. I don't sell this, by the way, under my label, but it's a good product. The fact that the FDA banned it is a crime. So let's look what the FDA prefers that you do take. Uh, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. This was a selective COX-2 inhibitor and let you see what I talked about at a, during a documentary that was filmed about uh, the problems within the FDA. Vioxx has killed at least 60,000 Americans. It caused about 130,000 excess cases of heart attack and stroke. It's one of the most lethal drugs ever approved because it was used by so many people. The total sales of Vioxx over its period of time it was allowed on the market was over $11 billion. And they had to pay the federal government a $950 million fine. They paid out about $4 billion in settlements to the victims of Vioxx. But the company is way ahead of the game in their fraudulent marketing. So if you're a big pharma company, you can sell a dangerous drug. We, by the way, identified the toxicity of Vioxx before it even became widely distributed. It actually causes more heart attacks, unfortunately. Great for relieving pain, but then you, you suffer heart attack risk. Um, but the fact is, uh, FDA allowed that drug to be sold and didn't do anything when it turned out to be dangerous to the executives, but they sure did a lot to the GNC and GNC executives, you know, threatening the five years in jail. Coenzyme Q10, FDA considered this a dangerous drug when it first came out. They put people in jail for selling it. Uh, they made people stop selling it. And unfortunately, that, that, that led to a lot of problems. Now, this is a reenactment of what the FDA started to do in the late 80s, 1990s of uh, stormtrooper raids, uh, uh, SWAT team raids, armed raids going against doctor's offices, vitamin companies, companies right now that you might see on the, on the shelf today that the FDA was calling them crooks and wanted to put them out of business. And we were battling the FDA back then, and we had a lot of allies because a lot of people were being simultaneously attacked. FDA wanted to deny consumers access to dietary supplements. And the reason I'm telling you this, by the way, is I contend there are effective therapies now that could possibly slow and reverse aging. If the FDA got it wrong on vitamin supplements, if they couldn't figure out these were safe, how are they ever gonna figure out some of the more advanced technology you're working on, like the Yamanaka factors? A lot more complicated than taking a dietary supplement. We were raided in 1987. They seized our newsletters, our vitamins, and they destroyed 18 anti-aging research projects that we were funding. And that really is a tragedy, because some of those projects could have led to an advance that could have led to a lot of people living a lot longer. But this is a newsletter they seized. It didn't promote anything except we were talking about the different scientists and, and the progress they were making with the research. FDA took everything. Now, we won this all back after litigating. Uh, FDA even had to pay our attorney's fees. But by the time we got it back, all of this was uh, mute, because the uh, vitamins are spoiled and the newsletters were pretty much out of date. So, FDA uh, didn't like the idea that we advocated for HIV positive people to take supplements to slow the progression of AIDS. Uh, they considered that a criminal act. Uh, so in 1985, this is what we published in our newsletter. And then in 1995, FDA Consumer, their magazine, advocated that HIV positive patients use dietary supplements to slow the progression to AIDS from HIV status. So again, 1985, we are attacked by the FDA, 1987, but this is what they used against us uh, for promoting just over-the-counter supplements, not, no special formula, normal supplements people can buy everywhere to slow the progression of AIDS. FDA consumer, 10 years later, says that's what you should be doing. Well, what happened in that 10-year interval? How many people unnecessarily died of AIDS? And then you move forward 30 years, and a meta-analysis showed that just taking supplements like zinc would reduce death risk by 71%. Selenium, a slow disease progression, 64%. This demonstrated that in 1985, we, and a lot of other people, by the way, we were correct. 
FDA was of the wrong side of the argument. And yet, because of the FDA's power, HIV people weren't allowed to hear that they should be taking some low-cost supplements, 12 to $40 a year, to slow their progression. So this is uh, me on a national TV show talking about what the FDA did to us, and it was later shown, unfortunately, to be an inaccurate maneuver on the FDA. I've had to stare down the barrel of a 45 caliber handgun. Uh, I've had FDA agents armed to break down my door, seize my vitamins. They don't like what I have to say. But what I said back in 1985 in our newsletter about using vitamins to slow the progression of AIDS now is acknowledged by the FDA as being true. It was Cody Brown's journal. It got a lot of, a lot of viewership because uh, I would show what we printed and the FDA's uh, consumer 10 years apart and the FDA agreeing with us. So that's the fatality. Uh, one of the reasons they hit us so hard is we were urging people to opt out of the FDA's regulatory umbrella to be able to self-experiment. And uh, they, they came after us. They wanted to put us in jail for a long time. I was indicted in November 1991. They were seeking 80 years in prison. And the benefit to all this is I got a lot of free publicity, front page of the Sun Sentinel. And I got to tell my side of the story what, that while FDA would have put us in jail, we had all kind of information about how people could potentially live longer, slow progression of HIV, and, and, and information like that. It enabled us to grow. And one of the inspirational figures that kept me going, because the FDA said, you know, if you just stop all this, Bill, we don't really care about putting you in jail. I, I'm, I said, I'm not going to stop disseminating truthful, non-misleading scientific data. And this individual jailed for six months for sitting at a Woolworths lunch counter. Uh, it was illegal back then if you were an African-American to sit at a whites-only counter. And he was in jail and offered plea deals. If you just quit going to these lunch counters, we'll let you out of jail. He said, no, if you let me out of jail, I'll go right back to that same lunch counter. And this is what we need more of in this country, people to be activists, to not let the FDA determine how long we're going to live. And the free publicity enabled our group. We only had 4,000 members when they attacked us. And by the time, well, I'll, I'll let you know as we move through, through with this, but we, we, we grew to 25,000, from four to 25,000 because of the free publicity the FDA gave us. And the FDA, in other words, induced the opposite effect. They were trying to stop the information being disseminated, and we wound up disseminating more than we ever could. So I got on the uh, ABC News day one. Uh, the media started paying attention to what we were saying because more and more scientific studies were validating it, including New England Journal of Medicine, Journal of the American Medical Association. They were publishing studies indicating HIV people should be taking these nutrients and people maybe will benefit from these vitamins. So a little clip from the Phil Donahue show to let you know the predicament we were in in 1995. The drugs on your sale list at the time of this uh, raid and arrest and indictment, which which is incidentally uh, remains, this indictment is alive today. Yeah, for 10 years, the FDA has been trying to put us in jail. Well, this audience may wonder what's taking the feds so long. Well, they have it a has. hard time because, see, they go out and interview people who take these therapies, and the people start yelling at the FDA agents for interfering with their ability to get these drugs. Yeah. They work on people. When they can't get them, they start feeling the effects of not using these therapies. See, That's what's holding them back. They mentioned the FDA Holocaust Museum, and I set that up in 1994, and that's what really garnered us the media coverage. We exposed the atrocities committed against the American public by an incompetent and corrupt agency. And the media would come in and look at this museum and said, well, we want to bring our cameras in here. We want to talk to you about what the FDA is failing to do. So it was a really interesting time. But as it relates to this drugs that we were advocating in our magazine, we didn't sell them. We advocated people just go out and buy them wherever they could. Metformin, the most popular drug now used to treat type 2 diabetes. Many drugs that we advocated had scientific substantiation beyond any doubt that they could pr protect people with type 2 diabetes from dying as fast as they were dying. And the FDA didn't want this information disseminated. But here's a, a really perfect example of what I'm talking about when there are existing therapies available today that we can't get our hands on. Ribavirin is a broad spectrum antiviral drug. It attacks a lot of different viruses, not COVID or HIV, but other viruses are favorably eliminated by ribavirin. Discovered in 1972. In 1983, we started recommending it to our members. 1991, FDA arrests me and charges me with all kinds of crimes for recommending an unapproved drug. And then the founder of the company that owned the patent, he started talking about, we're doing clinical trials, we're seeing results here. And the FDA brought criminal charges against him. And then move forward three years later, FDA approves ribavirin as a life-saving antiviral therapy, especially effective against 
hepatitis C when combined with uh, interferon. Uh, there's now better treatments for hepatitis C, but some of them still rely on ribavirin uh, to be used uh, concomitantly. So here's a perfect example of, unfortunately, delays. 1972, it's discovered, doesn't get approved till 1998. How many other therapies are out there right now that are languishing in this approval process in which the FDA is interfering with clinical trials? It's, it's truly frightening. And as it relates to the protection we now have with dietary supplement sales, there's a reason for that. Number one, we started a, a citizen's revolt back in 1977, or 87, 88. Uh, but these senators got behind a bill in Congress that legalized the ability for a dietary supplement company to let consumers know structured function claims, what it might do to help keep them healthier. These, uh, this is bipartisan, by the way, Senator Hatch, Senator Harkin, they got together, drafted this bill, and they persuaded the Senate to pass that bill. And this is why you have access to hundreds of different supplements on the market, you have access to information, and it's why I'm trying to get Jonathan Moore elected in the Senate. Because right now, we don't have an ally in the Senate to protect our health freedom rights. It's scary. It's scary not having people that can protect your rights. But as related to those criminal charges, hey, we won. FDA was forced to dismiss the indictment. Well, actually, a federal judge dismissed it after many pretrial motions. We bring in all of our experts. We bring in our documentation. We frankly overwhelmed them in the pretrial setting. And the Department of Justice filed a motion to dismiss the indictment. FDA was furious. They said, we want to put Bill in jail. And the judge said, well, number one, the jury's never going to convict him. And he seems to know the science and you don't. So we won. It was an unprecedented victory over the FDA. It's in our September 1996 issue, which you can access online to read all about our, our illustrious nine-year battle over FDA censorship. So what we won is... Uh, the ability to talk about dietary supplements in a truthful, non-misleading way so consumers know what they do. We forced the FDA to accelerate the approval of drugs like ribavirin. And by the way, the ribavirin approved in 1998. If I didn't go on national TV and promote that drug, I don't sell it, by the way. I promoted the value of it. I don't think it would have been approved in 1998. And we stopped the FDA from censoring off-label drug information. Metformin's an anti-diabetic drug. We think it has better anti-cancer properties. It may have some anti-aging properties we'll talk to you about. So this is the last thing I'm going to talk about our, our battle here with the FDA. We were funding 18 research projects in 1987. FDA raids us, takes our newsletter, takes our supplements. We had to start funding lawyers instead of scientists. And four years later, the judge ordered everything returned. They, they, they said the FDA was unlawfully holding our property and we wanted attorney's fees. All the anti-aging research from 1987 going forward didn't happen. All those projects were stopped. And I'm afraid this is happening in different ways today. We've got to break down these barriers, tear through these brick walls that are denying consumers access to validated therapies and also access to clinical research. And again, talking about metformin, that was approved in England in 1957. FDA approved it in 1994. 37 year delay. And well, here we are 66 years later, most people don't know metformin has anti-aging properties. We've got to abolish the over-regulation that exists within the FDA. And here we go up to 2017. Remember, we were recommending metformin as an anti-aging drug back in 1995. You go forward 22 years, 2017, JAMA published a study and it showed that pre-diabetic patients taking metformin reduced their risk of progressing to full-blown diabetes that people under 60 would get incredible benefits, and then metformin also had some weight loss benefits. So here, 1995, FDA is saying it's a criminal act to promote metformin, and 22 years later, the data comes in to show that it works really well. And then another study in 2019 talked about all the cardiovascular risk reductions that occur when diabetics take metformin, and wow, we calculated about four million American diabetics prematurely died because of the delay of this one drug and virtually every drug out there nowadays is delayed. We talk about the anti-cancer benefits of metformin in our magazine. We want people to know if you have cancer, consider adding metformin to conventional therapy. It might help save your life. If you have colon cancer, again, you might want to start taking metformin because you see the metformin patients taking metformin, they have much better survival, fewer metastases, and fewer deaths. 48% uh, 
of the people with metastatic uh, colon cancer uh, died on metformin, but if you weren't taking it, 76%. So I like those odds. I would be taking, well, I take, I've been taking metformin for 22 years anyway, but if I had cancer, I would get on metformin and several other repurposed medications to potentially improve my ability to survive. And as it relates to prevention, well, this study of MD Anderson showed diabetics taking metformin, 62% fewer cases of pancreatic cancer, reduced the risk that much. So again, I'm not a diabetic, I'm taking metformin, hoping it'll reduce my risk of pancreatic cancer. So here we are in 2015, and the world found out about a study that was going to happen, okay? And it made headline news. This is the front page of the Wall Street Journal talking about a fountain of youth drug that might enable people to live a lot longer. And this study was about to start right away. Older people were already working themselves into shape that they could qualify to participate in this study. Okay, it's 2016 and 2021, still waiting for that study to start, by the way. This is the brilliant scientist who's overseeing it, Dr. Barzelli at the Albert Einstein School of Medicine. He's very enthusiastic about what metformin can do. But well, here we are in 2023, we don't know of a single patient that's been recruited in this study. Not a single one. Now there could be one, but one of the problems with the FDA is they censor what a principal investigator can say about a clinical trial. In other words, if you're doing a trial and you're getting maybe really good results, you're not allowed to tell anybody until the FDA allows you to. You're not allowed to tell anybody about anything about that clinical trial until the FDA allows that. So we have censorship going on right now as it relates to clinical trials, and that does nothing but slow medical progress. And most of us in the room, we don't have time to wait. I've talked about multi-decade delays and people gaining access to life-saving medications. A lot of us, we don't really realize it. We're kind of hanging by a thread. We're just one significant disease away from falling off that cliff. And we're also trying to reverse aging. There's some research we're doing, and if you degenerate too much, we may reach a point where we're unable to do that. And if anyone feels that the clinical trials are being overseen by the FDA properly, I hate to give you the, the news, but they're, they're not. They're failing to do it. They're actually committing crimes in what they're doing. Uh, they're approving studies. Uh, let's put it this way. They're approving drugs based on clinical trials that never occurred. And in some cases, the FDA knows these trials never happened, but the data looks good, so we'll approve the drug anyway. And I'm going to play another brief clip of a documentary I participated in to expose FDA corruption. KTIC. Uh, it is a drug used as an antibiotic. There's plenty of other antibiotics out there, but KTIC, uh, that one caused severe liver damage. FDA had a hint that there was liver damage before the approval, but they approved it anyway. What's really frightening is the clinical study that was done to validate the safety of KETIC never occurred. It was done at a clinical research facility that was closed at the time that the alleged study was conducted. But KETIC did get approved, and as a result, it killed a lot of people, destroyed their livers, necessitated liver transplants, thereby ruining people's lives. It was something that never should have been allowed on the market, eventually was withdrawn, but it never should have been approved in the first place. Can you imagine that? Your doctor's relying on a clinical trial outcome to prescribe you a drug, and the clinical trial never even happened. It was just forged, and uh, some of the other cases, uh, this, this was a tremendous investigative report, by the way, in which a, a doctor who was supposedly treating patients with an experimental drug was actually just taking vacations, and, and since he was getting paid well, for doing this study, he could travel and he'd just sit on the beach or go fishing and fill in imaginary data and, and then submit that to the FDA. And they said, okay, we'll approve that drug. You got great data here, except the study never occurred. And these drugs get approved anyway, and no one seems to want to do anything about it. So I'm advocating for more open access for anti-aging researchers to do clinical trials that are going to be valid and they're going to be done because I'm going to be one of the ones overseeing them, by the way, and I sure want to know what those results are going to be. So we've got more and more people, they're talking about the FDA's historic failures as it relates to overseeing clinical trials and, and the delays that occur because of FDA uh, issues that can be resolved. It's very easy to resolve these problems. So as I put at the beginning of this uh, presentation, I'm just about done right now, 
the uh, Wall Street Journal, they published this on the front page, and that was two months after I started putting this presentation together. I thought to myself, are people going to believe me that the FDA is really delaying a research to this magnitude? The bottom line, they are. And they admit they don't understand the new technology. This is the technology we need to continue to live. They don't understand it, so they're just putting clinical trials on hold potentially forever. It's really scary, and this is not new. Cato talked about it in 1985. We talked about it in the early 1980s about the regulatory process. It's delaying access to life-saving medications. I've demonstrated that during this presentation. Popular Mechanics talked about it's curing death, living a lot longer. If the FDA just allows more clinical trials to occur, I want you to see just a clip of this HBO documentary in case there's any semblance of credibility as it relates to the FDA in the minds of people sitting in this room. If there's any semblance of credibility, I hope that removes it. Because as we all know, the opioid crisis has killed, well, officially 600,000 people. I can guarantee you it's over a million. A little old lady taking her, uh, her opioid drug and died. She died of cardiac arrest. They don't attribute it to the opioid. Anyway, a little excerpt from an HBO documentary. Within the last 20 years, more than 500,000 Americans have been killed by overdoses. Controlled release OxyContin would be the drug that triggered the opioid crisis. But what if we discovered that the crisis started with a crime? When we talk about drugs like oxycodone, you're talking about drugs that are essentially heroin pills. Opioid makers started to promote their opioids for common chronic pain conditions. Purdue didn't have any evidence that the drug was safe, so the company obtained the help of a medical officer at FDA. This is the first time I've ever seen this. This isn't just unethical. I think this could be illegal. Hundreds and hundreds of sales reps go out and meet with doctors and say, the FDA approved this. Yes, the FDA approved OxyContin for routine pain relief, saying it was less subject to addiction and abuse than conventional opioid drugs. It was all a fabrication. And the people in the FDA that pushed it through went to work for Purdue afterwards to make lots and lots of money. This is the revolving door that you hear about, but this is the revolving door in action. And it goes on all the time. A drug is introduced to, for FDA approval, and FDA officials are told, wow, you approved this drug. You've got a great job waiting for you. They approve it. Americans drop dead. No one seems to pay the price for it, except people, I guess, in alternative medicine. So where we stand today is there's lots of experimental age reversal interventions that thousands of people are utilizing right now. What we don't know is how well they really work altogether. We think they're working. I feel they're working in me, and I've seen some people's data looking good, but we need a clinical trial. And the FDA said no. Well, we want to do a multi-interventional trial involving pretty much every age reversal intervention you ever heard of. The FDA said that was too dangerous. We replied, people are already doing this. If we don't do the study, we'll never know if it's even safe or effective. And they still said no. We've got the money, we've got the science, we don't have the FDA's approval, and we're gonna do it a different way anyway because the science has emerged or has advanced so much since we submitted that application, we've got new interventions that we want to put into place. So the barrier that's keeping us from achieving super longevity is the FDA and Congress. Congress could change the law and we'd have no problem, but the FDA can internally change their policies to allow clinical trials to occur without the obstruction that's going on right now. And this is why I'm supporting Jonathan Nimord when he called me in mid-November and said, I'm gonna run for Senate in Virginia I was enthusiastic because I've known Jonathan for decades, and he's achieved unprecedented First Amendment victories against the FDA in federal courts. The reason you're allowed to hear about dietary supplements is not just the passage of that Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, it's Jonathan and Moore going into court when the FDA tried to attack it, tried to question whether or not it had any validity. He won those battles. He's very well respected in the dietary supplement industry, and I hope people will respect the fact that he wants to start introducing legislation, if he's in that Senate, to allow uh, clinical trials to occur. What I want everyone in this room and everyone who sees this video to do in the meantime is log on to this website and simply sign a petition, your name and email. That's all we need. The first step in suing the FDA, which we may be doing, is you first have to petition them and say, we'd like to have our people opt out of your regulatory stranglehold. And if you let us do that, then we can ascertain 
faster how these therapies work. So if we get a couple thousand signatures in a petition, FDA might just say yes. And they have precedent in doing that. With HIV, uh, there were issues where the FDA was delaying uh, the clinical trials. The HIV activist uh, kind of forced the FDA, and Jonathan can talk about it, he was on the front lines dealing with that, and the people were able to opt out of FDA's clinical trials regulatory structure and engage in research that often worked to save people's lives. So just so people are reminded who I am, I founded a group called Life Extension in 1977. I spent three years, and in 1980, someone joined our group. Someone wrote us a $27 check to get a newsletter. We've since grown to the largest consumer-based anti-aging group. This is a magazine article done about us back in 1977. That was in Palmetto Beach. We've been publishing for 43 consecutive years. We started as a newsletter. We graduated into a magazine because there were just so many new study data, so many new ways that people could protect themselves. This is the homepage of a website that I may launch this year, and it pretty much puts together all that information, all those millions of copies of books that I've sold, puts it together in one website. Hopefully, this will be irrefutable evidence that we need serious reform within the FDA. So uh, I want the group to know I've talked about a lot of victories, but we haven't always won. Back in 2002, the federal government banned stem cell research if any federal dollars were used. We put that on the front cover of a magazine. We asked our many supporters, write Congress, write anyone to remove that ban. We want to see stem cell research accelerate. If you wonder why we don't know a lot about stem cells now, after 20 some years, a lot of it is the federal government banned research on that. So please don't think because we've achieved unprecedented victories that we win them all. We do not win them all. And that's why I'm supporting Jonathan Ward uh, for Senate. Uh, he's gonna fight back against FDA corruption. Uh, abuse, deception, so much we could say that I want to introduce Jonathan very soon because this is the end of my presentation. And again, if you want to see any of these slides, available at this age-reversal.net website. And this concludes my presentation. And But I'm really going to conclude with what I wanted to uh, title it, and that is Regulatory Tyranny, FDA versus Humanity. Because when a life-saving drug is delayed, you are causing people to die. That's simple. You're dying of a disease, and a life-saving drug is there, but FDA says you can't have it, people die.